I, this is kind of my roadmap for today. Um, and uh, I kind of have these four points. And, and basically what I'm, I'm doing is walking you through a couple chapters of a book I've been writing. Um, and this, this isn't the whole thing, but it's some of it. Uh, as much as I could fit into about 40 minutes. Uh, the, the first one is kind of a big point is decision making is hard. We all know this. Uh, but I, I think in particular, I want to focus a little bit on the trade-offs between uh, decision making that's politically political in nature and, and decision making that's more kind of rational uh, in origin. Uh, and then I want to talk a teeny bit about public administration theory. While I, I'm not a PA theorist by, by any stretch of the imagination, I have, uh, of course, done my own due diligence to try to get up to speed on how what I've been doing and what we've been doing in the center has kind of connected more generally to PA theory. And that, that might be of interest to some of you. Um, the third one, and this is kind of the primary area of my focus, is how has, uh, what do we think of as workforce development? And uh, what do we mean by workforce decision making? What kind of metrics? What kind of uh, programs are we talking about? And then the fourth one is kind of the, uh, you know, kind of uh, buyer beware kind of message for a lot of these kinds of applied talks where, uh, you know, if you start talking about uh, kind of decision making, at what point uh, does it either get creepy, like a la the Facebook kind of mentality, or um, at what point does it just get weird, like, you know, you really can't learn anything of real profitable value uh, from the kinds of connections that researchers are try trying to make. Um, so I just wanted to lay out a few kind of scenarios to start with, and these, these, are, these are all uh, pretty, pretty real to me. Uh, the first one occurred at a, a meeting I was at in Moscow when I had a sabbatical there a while ago, and some ministry official from finance came up to me and he said, in, you know, in English, because I don't speak Russian, he said, the finance ministry just gave me a budget for 15,000 new engineers, you know, you're a guy who does matching of jobs and, and education, where, where do I spend this? Like, do I send it all to Vladivostok? Do I send it to Moscow, St. Petersburg? Where do we train these people? I mean, and he, and he basically said, we, you know, we've got all this basically demand in Moscow, but we don't have enough universities in Moscow. And moreover, if we give all 15,000 spots to the universities in Moscow, we, you know, basically don't help any other institution around the country meet meet the demand. So it's basically, you get a sense that this is a, you know, it's not an unusual situation for a, for a country that funds its education system largely centrally to um, kind of make that kind of statement. And it is almost as simple as just transferring funds to the universities because they don't have tuition fees the way we do here on um, the same kind of situation. The second one is just what we deal with uh, kind of every on a day-to-day -day basis in Ohio and many of the projects we've done at the center revolve around this question is how do you match supply and demand um, when you have a very dynamic labor market and you have lots of little suppliers like colleges or vocational schools and then uh, you have lots of uh, kind of demand uh, and then how do you monitor this is really the third question what kind of metrics do you put together to it at the federal or state level or international level to ensure that the system's functioning in an optimal in an optimal way. And these are just kind of designed to help motivate your thinking here. This is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I'm talking usually about a state or a federal government's authority. Uh, the regulations are kind of often decentralized to um, higher education institutions, but not always. In the case of Russia, for example, it's usually the central ministry. Uh, and then in many cases internationally, it's the finance ministry that has the ultimate authority uh, over budgets. It doesn't have anything to do with the education uh, departments uh, or with the universities themselves. They just receive funds like mana from heaven. So it's just a very different kind of decision making. And I won't talk a lot about the international cases, but I think they help illuminate how cases like Ohio are just very, uh, they may be very typical for the US, but they're very atypical internationally. So just the two kind of stereotypical uh, kind of examples to me, uh, and these are two quotes that I often really like. The first one comes out of a book that is a favorite book of mine when I went through comparative history program 
called Imagine Communities by Benedict Anderson. And I learned this lovely quote that a language is a, is a dialect of an army and a navy. So you get the joke, right? So basically, uh, to those who have you know, the, the power, go the spoils. Um, and in a certain sense, then, making decisions over where resources go, to which institutions, or to which training programs is basically, you know, I'm the governor, I get to decide. I'm the finance minister, I get to decide. Uh, if I want Moscow to grow, if I want Columbus to grow, well, that's, that's my prerogative. In contrast, there is this often quoted quote uh, around uh, kind of speaking truth to power, which originally came out as of, of a, a kind of community development orientation, but I think has often been taken by PA theorists to kind of imply that researchers kind of know what they're doing and can tell uh, politicians you know, how to spend money, how to allocate uh, dollars for training programs, for, for education programs. And I think they make a nice contrast verbally in terms of the political basis versus, versus the rationale basis. And I really think causality is, is a rationalist and kind of reductionist view of this decision making in many ways. But it's very critical. And if, if any of you have ever worked in the education space, you're familiar with uh, something called the What Works Clearinghouse, which is a Department of Ed uh, and Institute for Education Sciences website that catalogs models that have been proven to work in a uh, statistical sense uh, in terms of uh, student outcomes or uh, reducing student uh, disparity in student, student outcomes. And I, and I really think it's important to think of um, kind of these two models to me of decision making as kind of stereotypes uh, that are, are partly right in, in all cases. Um, and I see kind of my role in many ways is trying to veer between the two of these, being the kind of rationalist academic and also understanding that nobody's going to do what I tell them to do unless I understand the power structure they operate within. Uh, and help them kind of get the data that they need to uh, make the decisions that are meaningful to them. And I, I think that's a different kind of frame of reference for an academic. Uh, my motivations are not primarily uh, driven by uh, kind of uh, a theoretical perspective, although I think, as you'll see later, there is nothing as important in many ways of theory to helping understand uh, what the relationship is between program design and outcomes. But at the same time, uh, I really am conscious that most of us who've worked in the academic space on decision making uh, or in, in this college uh, are primarily operating from a kind of, a, you know, an empiricist, rationalist kind of basis. That's, that's the norm in academic discourse. Um, so just uh, an example that shows you how far back this kind of assumption goes, and this is an example I, I learned about uh, a couple of years ago. In the 1920s, actually, uh, this Chicago superintendent, William McAndrew, piloted the development of a model that determined pupil change scores for all teachers in the city of Chicago. Now think, this is 1920s under the progressive era, uh, and you've got these uh, big city school districts kind of responding to kind of Taylorist influences that are being disseminated around the country. And each city is basically trying to figure out how do I maximize my expenditures on teachers and how do I, at the same time, it's a very political question, how do I reduce the appeal of unions as a uh, political counterweight to my administrative control from a superintendent standpoint? And the, the model was, remarkably similar to the Ohio Revised Code rules for value-added models that exist today. You know, basically, uh, McAn McAndrew said he wanted to measure student learning at uh, two different times in the year. He wanted to develop a teacher evaluation system to attribute that student learning to teachers. That's basically what we see today. And he directed principals and administrators to organize student-to-teacher information and then determine school level performance. And then he wanted to figure out a way he could fire some people. So can you, you know, basically what ended up happening uh, is that 
Uh, we, we had some lessons from this, although apparently, uh, judging from modern day education policy, basically we haven't learned them, um, <laughs> that these, these measures are really hard. So coming up with an appropriate quantitative representation uh, that can be used to reduce the workforce in education or reward certain bodies of groups of individuals who are successful is, is tricky. Um, and the second one is, we should really worry about the relevance of these measures, the ability to differentiate between good and bad performers. Uh, you know, this is as true today as it was 100 years ago. Uh, a good test is really hard to design. It needs to be instrumented correctly. It needs to be kind of used appropriately. Uh, and, it, and, you know, the other one here is causality is really tricky. Just because an economist believes that they can measure the true impact of teachers on student learning, and I don't see Stefan here. I was hoping he would be here to, to hear this. Um, it doesn't mean that they can make <coughs> that sure that these models affect decision making. So these are basically um, kind of a cautionary tale uh, about the a, a full implementation of uh, and I thought it was interesting that this was 100 years ago because it kind of gives you a sense of how long we've been having these arguments in PA and governance overall. And you see examples of this scattered throughout the, the teens and the 20s, even the 1890s, if you go back to kind of governance in New York City. And I, I kind of have enjoyed uh, learning about those earlier models. So uh, the second... Uh, kind of uh, thing here is that government's role in decision making changed a lot in the workforce area as uh, labor became uh, a lot more uh, complicated and differentiated. Um, and we have these two kind of systems come up. Uh, now I'm kind of getting more explicitly into the workforce area. Something called vocational education, another called job training or workforce development. And they became kind of sources of skilled labor for industry. Um, and the problem with this is that uh, government um, is thought of as, as a way of solving these policy problems like the supply of skilled labor, the demand for skilled labor, and then there is a gap uh, because a lot of these decisions happen within a political environment. So a business can say, help, I need uh, skilled labor. It takes not only there is there a lag before government re re can reply, uh, but there also is a very, very, there's a lot of differences in opinion. So which government agency gets to respond? Um, which businesses are they listening to? Uh, you know, who gets rewarded? Who gets kind of the goods? Those are basic core kind of public administration kind of ideas about resource allocation and um, management within kind of a political environment. Um, these are some other examples to me of where decisions have run up against reality. Um, uh, they all have something to do with the workforce, although the, some of them are a little different. Um, I'll start with the bottom one because it's probably the most, to me, the most, it's one of the most interesting ones. Um, so there's this famous case of the Rand Corporation assisting uh, the city of New York to relocate firehouses. And it essentially, it was a workforce problem. It was a workforce planning problem where they, they wanted to make sure that they had firehouses in districts in New York where they could respond uh, to the fires that were coming in New York in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and the problem was is they ended up uh, kind of locating all the firehouses in rich neighborhoods when all the fires were occurring in poor neighborhoods. So the, the issue became less of a workforce issue and more of a social justice kind of problem. And I, I'm oversimplifying it, but there's, there's a very good book by Joe Flood on this. Um, the second one is a very, very kind of common example from workforce development on vocational education in Germany. And after the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, um, the apprenticeship systems in Germany were kind of taken from Western Germany where they had been built since the 1960s and then moved into Eastern Germany uh, into the landers that had kind of come into the, the German state. And that process was not smooth at all. Uh, there were a lot of 
of German uh, political divisions that had a very hard time uh, kind of going from statist control uh, of training and development to kind of uh, political control by, uh, by Lander. Um, the third example is one that I observed kind of in personally working for the World Bank in the late 90s in, in Asia. Um, and uh, you basically have this assumption that uh, uh, Asian countries kind of developed because they, um, they were kind of led by business. But we misunderstood and misattributed uh, a lot of the, the potential or the, the positive effect of centralized governments um, in kind of strengthening certain businesses uh, and then helping them respond to labor crises. So the way that played out in the aftermath of the 97 was huge subsidies for unemployment and a lot of job training uh, requirements. And I don't think we really understood that uh, in places like Korea, South Korea, and um, Taiwan, and Thailand, that those were necessary responses uh, that would fit within decision making. Um, and I think we, we misunderstood that a lot of that was, was very government driven. Uh, so I, to me, the concept of this polis that uh, I've seen in the public administration literature quite commonly um, helps me make sense of the way government makes these decisions, and decisions are a way of balancing individual self-interest and public community interest. Um, counting a problem in and of itself is, a, uh, is ambiguous and political. Um, and, you know, government can try to organize the decision making, say the Bureau of Labor Statistics is a good example where it's a very centralized uh, kind of uh, uh, decision making body that is, that is taken out of the political process. The director of BLS is, is, um, uh, is protected in many ways from being uh, punished because of bad labor statistics. Um, but poverty numbers, unemployment numbers are fair game, and they often get uh, kind of, uh, you know, how they're defined, what the poverty level is set at, um, what's counted as unemployment, or the unemployed or not counted as unemployed, are political uh, kind of uh, decisions that, uh, to me, just lay bare the, the uniformly, the, the difficulty that government has in making decision making in the workforce. Um, uh, kind of more straightforward. So, you know, there, there are some examples of how this emerged in kind of the 1960s and 70s, and particularly how uh, through kind of these, to me, there there's two bodies of scholarship that are most central to workforce development. There's a body of scholarship that kind of emerged uh, in studying JTPA and the effect of JPT, JPTA on employment. Uh, and there's a body of scholarship that comes out of this discipline called manpower planning. And both are kind of, manpower planning is, is it goes back to the kind of World War II. It's got a funny name, uh, and I'd be surprised if a lot of you in the room have actually heard of this or read any books on it. It very much fell out of favor uh, and kind of, but at its root, manpower planning is still practiced in labor market information systems. It basically is just, the methodology for connecting population statistics with employment change, with uh, kind of uh, the demand for education, and it, it's it's complicated, and there's a bunch of kind of uh, difficult kind of but rudimentary financial calculations you need to do to make it work. But it, it isn't it is very much still utilized, particularly in the Middle East and Eastern Europe, and by the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States. That's a lot of the methods they use. Uh, and then there are a lot of the labor econ econometric studies that have been done on employment outcomes, you know, by Heckman, Smith, others, have focused on a kind of uh, studying the uh, rollout of different job training programs. And they, they have related to this issue of decision making often by focusing on the role, focusing on the role of case managers, case workers, um, cities, uh, and the like. Some of the other ones are more tangentially related to this direct discussion, but are very important to the academics of, in the room. 
uh, a lot of the research utilization literature comes out of work that Carol Weiss did in the, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and then just the statisticians and people who work on data visualization have had a lot to, a lot of kind of, a lot of that goes back to work that Tufti did in the 70s. So performance management is kind of measurement, is how I kind of centralize, how I focus my uh, deliberation about what workforce decision making has, where it comes from, and how it's utilized in the current uh, government space. Um, we have the emergence kind of a, uh, in the job training system in the US of performance standards uh, starting in the 1980s uh, under the modification of JTPA. And then the current legislation under RIOA developed these uh, set of common measures which are generally involve employment earnings, retention, skill attainment. And these are basically the same metrics that are used throughout government uh, programs of the workforce. Um, and are particularly, um, they're, they're almost universally applied at a, a conceptual level. <laughs> there are some programs that don't use them uh, at, at the state level and the state contract with the, the federal HHS kind of out, that rules the, uh, the common metric sometimes. Um, in Ohio, uh, kind of the common metrics are used in kind of mandated reports to the federal government, but we in the OERC have helped kind of develop a, what I would call common metrics uh, measures too. <laughs> which are called the success measures, and I'll show you a website that we built um, to kind of incorporate that into decision making. Um, there are kind of, the state of Washington, for example, provides annual reports on the effectiveness of these workforce programs through net impact reports. <coughs> and Kentucky has developed these um, kind of uh, county or uh, workforce reports focusing on the effect of kind of skilled workers uh, in K through 12. So what I've kind of gone through up to this point is I've kind of gone over um, this, I, I feel like it's, it's a little more, I've made it probably more complicated than it needs to be, but I have always struggled with the fact that these are two, these are two opposing kind of ways we conceptualize decision making in organizations, and in the context of workforce development, I think we've pretended that things are rational <laughs> when they are, when most of the resource uh, kind of decision making uh, is entirely intensely political. And we really haven't acknowledged that that kind of that embeddedness of the decision making within the political frame. Um, but we, you know, kind of the imposition of this common measures and performance measurement has kind of made it seem as if everything could be done according to scientific procedures and increasingly in an automated fashion. So a lot of the discussion about using machine learning or or predictive analytics kind of, I think, uh, makes it harder to, uh, for people to believe that the decisions are political in nature because it kind of distracts people with fancy numbers, you know, more complicated numbers. The work, just to give you a sense of how this plays out in the workforce system, I, I kind of have to give you a sense of just the scope of the workforce training system in the United States. So these are like the five largest programs in DOL funding. Um, most of the money runs through unemployment insurance, but they're kind of fairly significant kind of uh, uh, um, regulatory functions that the department uh, performs. Workforce training, um, has kind of in obviously increased the, per per the number of people who receive workforce services um, increased over the last 15 years. 
uh, in a significant way, even though the number, the amount of money kind of has largely been static or declined. The only uh, funding that has really increased here is this dislocated worker funding. Uh, the Wagner Pizer and the WIOA funding, even CTE funding, have declined over time. Um, and I, I think, you know, um, these, these programs are largely thought of in both direct or, or active labor market programs and indirect programs or passive programs. But then there's also these regulatory functions that government performs. Um, most of what uh, we in the center deal with are these active programs. So we deal with the job training and the kind of uh, assistance to individuals um, through SNAP or TANF, where they actually get some practical training services from government. We don't really deal with these. And the unemployment benefits or job search <coughs> services, those are more delivered, more and more passively over the internet. Um, so they're, they're more complicated. So I kind of am racing through some of this writing that I have, but the, the last thing is, I, I wanted to kind of give you some caution um, about, well, I want to walk you through a couple things we've done in Ohio so you have some sense of that and how it relates to what I've been talking about. But I also wanted to just um, kind of describe this in more specific detail, how I think we respond to the opportunities that technology provides for decision making, but also uh, I'm a little scared of them. So. Um, so performance standards, as we've talked about, kind of have been set up, and they're pretty standardized and pretty universal. Um, but these local government really implements these standards in separate systems. So they're not, um, even though the, the, the kind of federal metrics, these common metrics are kind of set up up here, um, and states have agreements with the federal government about, say, Kind of retention rates or job performance. Um, you know, th there is this this problem. There's a there's a gap between local and state a action and the federal measures. Um, so, you know, basically what I what I believe is that, you know, the local and state government are not getting what they need out of the federal performance measure system to be able to make the changes that they need to monitor the, the, the training outcomes. So we really, in order to influence local action, we really need to make use of these different tools that are out there. And that, that's what we've kind of built. Um, there are some examples that from the workforce literature, particularly um, from, the, uh, from literature that came out of sectoral training programs in Cleveland or Oakland or New York City in the welfare reform movement in the 1990s or in the uh, uh, kind of recent WIOA uh, a kind of reauthorization in 2014 that, that kind of how workforce programs can be su successful if they're integrated with industry. And the interesting thing about both Gilloth's work in uh, you know 20 years ago and 10 years ago and he's been very consistent uh, in his writing is that you know he kind of Organize, organizes around cities. And the sectoral programs organize around, because they're sectoral, organized largely around geographic areas in and of themselves. So you're taking advantage of the fact that there's a common set of, of decisions that a contiguous geographical area needs to make, a region or a, uh, a decision. And it's very hard for, it's very hard because under this first line here, you're using kind of standardized metrics that the federal government is defining. So they, they seem to work well in operation in context, particularly in large urban areas where there's enough employers and enough um, uh, training organizations to kind of interact. Um, so Ohio has responded in different ways by creating data systems in the 1990s, such as EMIS or the Higher Ed Information System, and then in the research side, and this is where I kind of came into the mix, is kind of, I was involved in this earlier aid air effort 
for the Department of Labor and in something called the Workforce State Equality uh, Initiative from the Department of Labor. And then uh, our staff have kind of created this Ohio Longitudinal Data Archive uh, and with the state of Ohio as a way to kind of localize, I think the way I see it is localize these decisions, localize the data, you know, make, recognize the political nature of these, of these systems and try to provide more kind of uh, customized information for, uh, for local government in Ohio. So these are just a couple of examples and uh, I'll quickly just show you these. So this one is something called the Workforce Success Measures Dashboard. Um, and it provides county level information or state level information um, on uh, the key kind of WIOA metrics on these kind of basic common metrics over here. Do you find employment? Do you get skills? Do you enhance wages? And um, the staff have worked kind of very hard on putting together um, kind of statewide and community reports on pretty much all of the, the statutory programs. So this is just an example of a report. I can get this to work. <coughs> can you see a bottom there? Step, I can't see a bottom. Three, yeah, you no, it's not. Location. It's just not scrolling. That's the problem. I think it's a an IE. It's not a something with the browser. Thank you, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, you get two sets of views. You get workforce program views, and you get you know, kind of geographic views. And these are you know, designed to be used by county commissioners, by uh, workforce system administrators, as a way to kind of get high-level outcomes on all of their programs at once. Um, so this is uh, kind of you have service delivery outcomes, you get outcomes, outcomes, so the number of completers, the earnings they're getting, and you can kind of go down and click these different tabs here. Now, I've mostly presented this in past presentations as kind of an instrumental, uh, kind of it answers a question kind of tool, but if you think about it in the context of which I'm presenting today, where is this trade-off between politics and rationality, I, I see this as a as a space for conversation. This is a, a, a kind of a tool where you know politicians and administrators in the workforce system can look at it and have arguments about you know well is that employment rate appropriate? <laughs> is this one for youth really too low? And in fact, this youth one with the percent employed and the average earnings rates being so much lower the other programs, you really do have a conversation because most of us really know why that occurs, but you know, if you're a newly elected county commissioner, you may not know and you may want to have a conversation about it. So to me, it's, it's kind of an opportunity for, for discussion. Um, and then this is just another tool we've developed about supply of skilled labor in the, uh, in the state. The way it works is you can pick an occupation area, let's just pick actuaries, first one there is A, and you see certain information and then kind of the density of providers um, of programs around the state and actuarial sciences. And you know, it's designed to be used. Uh, so kind of where I uh, I mean, we're not the only state that does this, and I think that's important to know. You know, the so state of Kentucky has a lot of reports. The state of uh, kind of Washington has a lot of different reports. Um, I think there are 
I'm kind of at a point where I want to connect the application of this with some of the theory, and so that's what I've written a manuscript about. Um, and I really think there's kind of three ways that we make this more useful for decision makers. One is we have to just improve their engagement with data, um, and through kind of increased data sharing. Um, I think the role of the legislature is really important here and something a little underutilized, uh, under discussed uh, in our group certainly. We really lack cross training across executive bodies at the state level. Um, people tend to stay in their silos for their careers if they work for a labor agency, they tend to work for labor, if they work for education, they tend to work for education. Some staff cross over, but not the, the data staff seem to stay for the most part. And I think that's a, that kind of prevents a lot of group learning uh, about that can be useful for workforce decision making. And I, I think it would be good if, if state or local government could adopt a more permissive uh, policy on data, you know, on uh, job progression. And I think it would help uh, a lot of this, uh, kind of, of the silo nature of these decisions that, that are made. The one about business is, I think, really critical. We've seen through the state board in Ohio a lot of business people interacting with the data that we present. I have not seen that translated into better decisions. And I think that's a really interesting problem. At what level of government should business be interacting with the data? How can they uh, express their opinions that they're having trouble finding skilled labor and at the same time uh, kind of help solve that problem. Because a lot of times it's just complaining. It's like, I can't find enough radiologists in Cleveland. You know, I can't find enough welders in Belmont. You know, too bad. You know, pay more, pay more wages. That's, that's normally what a lot of people will say. The, the, the problem though is you can't do that if you're representing the education system. You have to work actively with businesses uh, on this problem you can't simply just declare that they're either not really thinking about it or they're thinking about it in the wrong way. You have to work with them. So it's an engagement problem uh, with workforce data. The second one is I really do, I am, I am a kind of rationalist in, men, in, in one way at minimum. I like centralized decision making for workforce development, at least in terms of supplying data. I think you need strategic planning, and we have a statewide strategic plan. We have county strategic plans for a lot of programs. I'm not exactly sure why um, having strategic plans doesn't result in better decision making using this data at the local level. And I think that's an important kind of theoretical question for people in Glen. If, if there are students interested in working on that, I think that's a really interesting problem. Is you got all this new strategic planning, but nobody's kind of apparently using it to make better decisions. Uh, I think there is a, a gap between strategic planning and then statute. And I think that is a really a critical kind of gap in many ways that state government uh, has a lot of obligations for, for strategic planning, but they don't follow through with obligations for outcomes reports so that they can measure whether the strategic plans are effective or not. Um, so you, you kind of need that. And then the last piece is transparency. We've seen a lot of examples of transparency today. I've shown you some for Ohio. Uh, there's a fabulous data website that the Obama administration put together on the college scorecard. Uh, and then there's a lot of states that do high school feedback reports. So they provide data back to high schools on the workforce outcomes of their high school graduates or their community college graduates. Um, the Census and University of Texas have put together a, a really interesting partnership to look at wage outcomes of, uh, of workforce data. We don't know if any of this is, is effective. <laughs> we don't know if any of this increased transparency helps people make better decisions at the individual level. <coughs> we have a value in public administration that transparency is good. We think that keeping data secret is bad. But do we, how do we know if this is actually having an effect? 
uh, on, uh, on decision making by individuals. So the last thing I want to say is just predict about my, my cautionary note uh, for the day, and I've said this in meetings a few times, Prediction makes me really nervous right now. Uh, we do it in the center, but we, a couple of the tools I showed you have prediction modules in them, but they're group prediction, like does a, a, you know, if you have 10 years of data, does the trend continue? Which is very much from the old discipline of manpower <coughs> planning. That's kind of how I learned how to do things in graduate school. It's very common from the 1990s. Um, but when you start getting at prediction, you know, how do you find a job, or you know, what kind of pattern of jobs are there for students? You start talking about individuals, and then you, you have, I worry about the, uh, not only the, I worry more about the validity of the, of the prediction. And uh, I worry less about the data security because I feel like a lot of times there are ways to deal with data security, like the on-course tool that OSU uses where you have access as an individual student if you're not an undergrad, you probably don't know what this is. But OnCourse is a tool that counselors and students can use to see whether if they change their major, what would, the, what would their likelihood of success be like? If they were gonna take this calculus class, what would the grade be like? It's a very, very sophisticated predictive tool. And I, I do worry in some ways about how it's used. Um, and, and it really depends on the underlying statistical models that they're using. And so, I, I personally, I, 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 I am bullish on data science. I am bullish on kind of techniques like machine learning or use of expanded use of logistic regression to estimate outcomes. Uh, and I think they help us get beyond just kind of static, kind of manpower planning forecasting, which is what I've done in the past. But I worry. And I think we all should worry whether where individual predictions are kind of out there, um, uh, whether they're they're in fact necessary for the decisions that individuals need to make. So, um, I think I'm yeah. So you've got some websites to go to. Again, there's some dashboardy type things on the back page, back table. Jill is showing them off. I have, for some of you interested in the da accessing some of the data I talked about, we actually uh, process applications for students and faculty. Students, it takes a little longer uh, sometimes. If you don't have a, if you have, we ask they have a faculty sponsor, so you might want to talk with your advisor about this. But you feel free to take one, and most of the people over there work with us. They can talk to you. Um, Josh, thank you. You have is Ohio centric. They want other stuff. Or or yeah, like yeah, yeah. I mean, the census data for, like, the census data for Texas, where they matched all of the higher education outcomes for Texas, is available on the LEHD website now. It's pretty cool. Uh, so you can get some other states' data. Uh, the you get a lot of data. Um, they're starting to to archive some of the multi-state longitudinal data archives through SAS and uh, the state of, basically something called WICHI, Western Interchange, Higher Education Interchange. So they're starting to archive a lot more state records. But there's a lot that can be done with Ohio data and I had lots of students do dissertations and uh, research reports using Ohio data on workforce systems in Ohio, and I would be happy to work with, with others. Other questions? I know I've rambled a lot. It's not easy. <laughs> yes? So, uh, one of your slides is about engagement with the data. Yeah. And um, one of the projects that Ned and I worked on was over a year ago. It was they wanted to use data, and we worked with them got some stuff on paper and they still haven't used it like a year later like how what is it just nominal engagement or do, are these yeah are they are they actually trying to use it to do more than just describe well I, when when you say they used it so I think there are different ways to evaluate use yeah. so we've learned a little bit about 
Google Analytics, you can track website hits. So that doesn't necessarily, that's not, doesn't involve eye tracking. So you don't know <laughs> what people are looking at and you also don't know what they're doing with that information. So to know that, you basically have to do <coughs> interviews. You have to ask them. So we've, we've done various things at different times. We've asked county, we've asked, you know, unions, where do you get your information on education? You know, you physically just have to ask them and then hope that they're gonna tell you the truth. Um, you know, asking job search candidates where they're getting the job posting is pretty easy, but asking them kind of where they got information on say prevailing wages or you know, how they made their decision to move to Columbus over Indiana, that's harder. So there are some kinds of data that you, you can monitor engagement with really easily and others that you just have to hope. <laughs> so I'm not surprised nobody's used it, that's normal. Don't be disheartened. A question came to my mind about, um, we were talking about data sharing among government bodies. Yeah. There's um, a committee, the Ohio Department of Higher Education, that yeah. is working specifically with our active military members because our state is very military heavy in all mm. five um, branches of the military and also through the National Guard. In the same way, so we have a lot of young people that are involved in that and about a year before they're going to separate out and come back into civilian life, they're trying to match up their skill level with where the employment occurs or could occur here. Right. And make sure they're properly educated because there was a house bill passed so that all the Ohio uh, state higher education um, entities can give them like club testing, mastery, mm -hmm. credits so they can come in at different levels. So is there anything that's being shared that you know of? between the information that you presented here and that particular group? Because it seems like, especially that state map where you had the color-coded regions, yeah. that would be really helpful to the things they're trying to match up. I know that the, the sort of the military component is, is, has been a missing piece for a number of years. So like in terms of in the K-12 space, we know the student goes to um, the higher education institution in Ohio, and now there's a new data set where we can track students' higher education anywhere, but it doesn't say if they've gone into the military. And so getting access, so in terms of the sharing, we have a lot of sharing happening within entities in Ohio, but the military is the military. It's not, it's not a state agency in Ohio. They don't come, you know, like figuring out how to, you know, how to get them engaged is is a challenge. And so so that is that has been, I don't know, Josh, if you or any other conversations, but I know in the well, 12 space, we've really been trying to figure out, I, you know, because that's sort of, like you said, it's a lot, a lot of folks follow that path in terms of looking, getting a comprehensive view of students' educational and career pathways, but we don't have that piece yet. I, I do know, so we, we have an undergraduate research program in the center, and this summer, one of the projects is to connect some of the, the veterans' data with workforce training data. So, because um, we have a whole year to expose them before they actually separate. Yeah. And they're using mechanisms to do that, but you know, our state's leading the way in this respect. It's also leading the way in terms of nationally setting up these parameters yeah. to get people re-employed and. Yeah. I, and I and I would and I would say this is a good example of where transactionally the data matching uh, lags way behind the demand. So this, this is like a good example of also where you want to be careful with, with prediction. So if you, if you identify somebody, uh, you know, close of service date is June and they've got a couple of years experience, you know, as a welder, uh, you might reasonably assume that they could make the transition to civilian to welding. And that would be a good transition for them and it would take a very small amount of training. but you might have other people whose skills are more general. You know, say they were an MP or something like that. You know, they, they may or may not, you know, want a career in law enforcement or they may not have the ability to do that. So you have to be really careful with these kinds of advice, you know, based on data systems, uh, because there are these one to one matches that are easy like carpenter to carpenter, those match between military skills and civilian skills, but others don't always match. 
questions? Yep. Yes, you set this up uh, in terms of <coughs> work on workforce policy. Right? Yeah. And so you made several references to PA theory. Yeah. Just like saying, you know, making a reference to Cinderella. It's yeah. I know. A big possible thing. So do you have actual models in mind? You know, taking theory down to the model level <coughs> of kind of the interaction between rational and political. Um, or I mean, is is it really essential to your story? Or yeah. Is so so I think I think the easiest place for me to think about the models were the the models of research utilization. So you know you kind of uh, see those in the literature more generally, and there are some specific studies of how research data is utilized in government decision making. I, I, you know, there are decent studies in the workforce area about uh, generating outcomes data that is reliable and high quality mm -hmm. program matters, but there's very little data on, there's very little program model on how people take that information and then use it, and that's the problem. So there's rel basically what it is is that there's well, and then the next step is to interpret it then use it. Yeah. So I, I think what I came across was was very were very few empirical tests of the use of uh, program outcomes data in decision making, and I found it very frustrating. The literature search part it was very frustrating. There's a lot of general thought about how you can use data, but I don't find that particularly worth citing. And then the other part citing. of PA theory that brought up was kind of this truth to power thing. Yes. And frankly, whenever I see it in an academic setting, I ignore it because it yeah. usually means, look, I'm smart, pay attention to me. And that's what I, I thought, and too. And it's all about me. Yeah. But I, I think the point, Ned, and I'd be curious, is to me what it it, it, it is kind of there is a trope about research evidence, particularly in education, needing to be high quality experimental design that guides practice. So from a math teacher, I'm supposed to make decisions based on you know, effect sizes from the six greatest math outcome studies. It's ludicrous because you can, you can be correct in a good modeling sense that those are the appropriate ways of measuring the effectiveness of math. But that has no relevance to a math teacher trying to teach the subject. And you learn that if you look at the literature on research utilization. And um, there's a great paper that Dick Murnane wrote for with NBER looking at use of, uh, of information by doctors in medical decision making. I really liked years ago. And it, it's, it's absolutely true that doctors are supposed to be the most quintessentially uh, rational decision makers. They're not. They make decisions most of the time based on, on uh, a c collection of information, not solely based on statistical data that they've gotten from double blind randomized controlled trials. So I, I think I think to me that you know I see that speaking truth to power and I think of it I, I discount the, the you know the study as well because I think what it means is that I'm I'm I feel like my data should cure you of your poor decision making. Right. But nobody's really helping. So in Michael Lewis's kind of popular book and doing project, mm -hmm. there's about a chapter and a half on medical decision making. Okay. Um, it's, it's really well done. And, Good. And it's done in, in, in kind of the setting of uh, behavioral economics. Good. Other question here? Last question. Thank you all very much. <laughs>